Um, I just want to let everyone know uh, how they can participate in today's session. Uh, we will be in listen-only mode, uh, so we invite you to ask questions uh, using our questions pane. Uh, we will be saving some time at the end of the presentation for a Q&A session uh, with our panel. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and we will provide you a link to the recording as soon as it is available. You have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to use your telephone, just locate your audio pane and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. Let me introduce you to our panel. Uh, first of all, we have Andrew Ford, who is an IT Client Solutions Specialist in Information Technology here at Global Knowledge Canada. He has been with the company for over 10 years, and as a resident IT expert, Andrew consults and assists in building prescriptive learning plans that will ensure the successful deployment of new technology. And as a special treat today, Andrew and I are joined by Thomas Polancis and Brad Haynes. Thomas is our business training client solutions specialist, managing Global Knowledge's project management and business analysis divisions. Brad is here as our specialist in Cisco, Avaya, and Juniper client solutions. So we'll have a lot of information and a lot of different viewpoints from our panel, so please keep your questions coming. So welcome everyone, and with that I'm going to turn it over to you, Andrew. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, welcome uh, to my fellow panelists here. Um, Thank you. Today, with the agenda, we're going to take a look at um, a, sort of a quick review of what we looked at on Tuesday, because those of you with us on uh, Tuesday's webinar, uh, we talked about IT careers and how they're changing, uh, currently changing. So we're going to have a look, quick review of that so everybody's on board and talk about the same thing. Then we're going to take a look at some of the myths and stories about certifications, and some of the things that you may have heard. We will then take a look at some reasons to certify, and then finally, we're going to have a review of some of the top certifications for IT professionals out there. And that's really why I'm going to bring in uh, my panel here and have them talk about some of the areas that uh, you might be interested in, and certifications you may not have thought of or may not have considered for your role. So we are Global Knowledge, and one of the things that uh, makes us a little bit different is that we deal with people. Um, we are not a hardware or software company or a system integrator. We deal with training people. We train in all the lines of business. We've got uh, leadership and business solutions. We've got IT courses, and we've got business process. We find today, the environment, people need a, a, a wide range of skills. And in fact, one of the things we discussed in the last webinar was that IT was going to become part of business in many different levels. So it was no longer going to be IT at the end of the hall, uh, a door that you went and knocked on when your printer wasn't working. IT was going to become part of the business. And IT was going to integrate itself into the business, whether it be accounting, human resource, sales, marketing. It didn't really make a difference. IT was going to be part of the way we did business. And that's what's happening today. That's what's happening now. We also discovered that a lot of IT skills we knew from yesterday would not be around for much longer. And we looked at things like server admin skills. I'm sure there's people on the, on, on the webinar today who consider themselves uh, server administrators. It doesn't mean the skills that you have are no longer needed. We just no longer need you in that particular role. We need you doing more things. And this goes for things like Adobe Flash, Silverlight, uh, software installation support, some of the old programming languages, middleware. Um, all these sort of things are sort of on the brink of extinction. We also discussed how the support model was going to change. And that in the traditional support model, we had network support application and desktop support, and the largest group was always help desk support. They were the people who came to your desk side to help you to make sure that you're up and running. And that's going to change in the new model. And the main reason for that is things like BYOD, bring your own device. Because it really boils down to, if I'm providing a service online, I'm providing a service through a web, can you access my website? And if you can, great. If you can't, then unfortunately, we've got to take a look at what's wrong with your machine. And if your machine happens to be um, some sort of tablet or, or phone, um, then you're probably going to be sent back to your supplier. So talk to the guru, not to your internal support. And that changes fairly dramatically how support is handled. So network support and access support as being the middle area to sort of keep things up and going and give us that pipeline. But the largest area of growth was going to be in the technology services. And these were going to be providing new services and new opportunities 
for IT in every part of the business. And that's where we're going to find the biggest changes. By 2018, adoption of mobile, social, cloud analytics will redefine 90% of IT roles. And we saw that that will break down into possibly two different areas, IT specialist and IT advisor. As an IT specialist, we're looking at highly skilled consultants. They're going to have higher compensation. They're going to be paid more. However, they're also going to have to reskill constantly. They're going to be looking at training and downtime. So for some time they'll be paid more, but sometimes they won't be paid at all. They're going to have career highs and lows. They're going to be jumping from project to project. They're going to be at high risk for technology changes. They're going to have to keep up on a constant basis. They're going to be looking at roles as IT consultant, application developer, system integrator, work for IT service provider as a specialist could be one of the examples. Some people are going to really enjoy this role. This is why they got into IT, is they wanted to be on the leading edge all the time. However, there's also going to be a large role for the IT advisor. They're going to have moderate levels of compensation. They're not going to be highly paid per hour as our specialists. However, they don't need to spend as much time reskilling and having to stay on top of things at all times. They are a generalist IT with business process skills. They are the link between the business and IT. They have a fair amount of career stability and technology skills are kept wide ranging. They know a lot, but they don't necessarily go deep in different areas. They will hire in a guru when they require a guru. So we're looking at things like resource manager, application architect, business system analyst, service manager, IT auditor. These will be the roles of the IT advisor. When we talk about the IT advisor, we find that they sit between the business and technology. They are there to provide both sides of the equation. I want to just do a quick check here if we can, um, do a quick poll and find out in your current role, would you consider yourself more of an advisor or a specialist? Sarah, can you put up a poll? There we go. Right me. Everyone, uh, in your GoToWebinar viewer, you will see our first quick poll. In your current role, would you consider yourself more of an advisor or specialist? Choose one, advisor or specialist. We'll give everyone just a moment uh, to place their votes. And I will let everyone know that we do have uh, time at the end for questions. So please enter your questions into the questions pane. All right, I'm going to close this off and let's share the results. 50-50, exactly. Is that wow. what you thought? That's interesting. No, I, I, I really didn't know what the answer here was going to be. Um, Thomas, Brad, anything that sort of jumps out at you? No, it's, it was nice to see that it's a 50-50 split. That tells us that they're, they're equal. Yeah, yeah. And they might be seen as equal in front of the business. So let's ask a different question again, Sarah. I want to know what people, you know, that may be where they ended up, but what do they really want? So. Yeah. Regardless of your current role in the future, would you rather be an advisor or a specialist? So let's see if this has has changed any. Let's see if people are in the roles they want to be in. All right. A lot of activity here, so I just want to give everyone just a few more seconds just to place their votes, um, and then we'll show it up on the screen. All right. 58 and 42. Interesting. So there's a few people out there who are you know, maybe not in the role they want to be in, and maybe want to make a change. Well, that makes a, a move from uh, being, having to be a specialist all the time over to an advisor. Um, and maybe sort of, you know, I wouldn't say relax, but sort of take on different roles, take on more of a planning and uh, less of a technology role. That's interesting. Okay, fantastic. All right, back to you. So that sort of uh, puts us in a frame mind. We're going to take a look at some uh, myths about certification, and then we're going to go and take a look at how these different roles and how different certifications could help with these roles. So let's take a look first at sort of debunking some of these myths. So one of the myths we hear on a regular basis is that companies don't care about certification. And this is funny because you can sort of debunk this one very quickly by looking at different ads. Because every time I look at a technology ad, the first thing I see they're asking for is technology certification. So I look for a program manager or a, or a, a business analyst ad, I'm looking for certification. 
So if they didn't care about it, they wouldn't be asking for it in, uh, in their people. So the reality is many companies make certification requirement or even a benefit for new hires. Okay? Um, more, you know, uh, better consideration given to those who have certifications. Promotions and even project assignments. And that project assignment is actually going to make a big difference in, the, in, in coming up. And I'll get back to that. So we actually have something here from CompTIA International. I looked at really how companies felt about certifications and what the value is. So we got no formal uh, position towards certification, about 25%. However, if we take a look at the other two, they have an informal, not required, but encouraged at 41%, and about 28% out there are required to have certification. So that's the majority of them are looking at certification. Uh, as being uh, important in value. Okay, let's have a quick look at myth two. Those who certify leave the company. I hear all that. There's no point getting my people certified, they'll just leave. Well, the reality is that employees who keep their skills up to date with help from their company actually stay with that company longer. They feel more secure. They feel, you know, that they have value and they feel that they've got, if they, if they should leave the company, that they'll be able to maintain their standard of living. What we do see, though, is employees who spend money on their own certifying, who make the investment themselves outside the company, want to get an ROI on that as quickly as possible. And from that, we see people leave. Oh, yes, so-and-so got certified, he left right away. Well, because he certified by himself. He spent money, he invested, and he wanted to see some return on that investment. So that's really what the crease is there. Certifications don't reflect the real world. We hear this on a regular basis. Real-world experience does not provide a complete picture. It's funny because you go to a lot of companies and I ask, well, when's the last time you actually installed a server? They do a lot of monitoring these servers, maintaining these servers, but there's certain functions we only do once in a while because they don't need to be done on a regular basis. So in fact, going through training and going through certification forces you to look at skills and skill sets that you don't normally look at in your day-to-day. It is actually a larger look at the skill set than what you would get from your company. 62% of Canadian leaders agree that certification shows proven experience. Training is important, but certification isn't. Well, the reality is certification places metrics around the training effectiveness and helps students focus on what's important. It's very easy to sort of listen to people you know, talk to you and to, to go through some books and to do some labs and that's absolutely how we learn. But certification allows us to apply that knowledge and really understand what we know and what we don't know. What we think we know and what we don't know. And 73% of Canadian IT leaders, and again this is from the come to your study, believe it's important to test after training to confirm those knowledge gains. And I believe that. Okay? It's very easy to go, yep, 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 until you get to a point where you, you know, do you really understand it. Companies don't see the value in certification. While 60% of Canadian leaders believe IT certifications will increase in importance over the next few years. They actually do it and they see more value in certification today than they have ever before. I like this one. Certified IT professionals are no more than non-certified IT professionals in the same position. And that simply isn't true. There's many studies that have, been, that have um, pointed out that actually those who hold a certification in their field earn more than those who don't. There's always an exception. There's always that one person you heard about who never took any classes, who never certified, who happens to earn more than you do. Um, but they are the exception. The reality is the majority of people who have certifications end up earning more than their counterparts who don't. So where do these myths come from? Well, it's actually not hard to figure out. Those who play down the importance of certifications usually have an ulterior motive to do so. Either they don't want to pay for the value of the certifications, we don't believe in certification, and we don't believe in paying for the value of those certifications. Or they don't have the skills required to get the certification. There's a bit of sour grapes. Oh, well, you know, it's great that you have a high-level tech certification, but it really doesn't mean anything. Well. It's very hard to say, you know, from the other side of the fence. So you've got to really understand, you know, who's saying this thing to you 
and why. We've seen a lot of value placed on certifications for many different reasons. We see clients who ask for certifications because they want that metric on the training, and we've seen students who ask for those certifications because they want the recognition, and they want to know that they are uh, responsible for what they're doing. As new roles are created, companies will try to map the current skills to those new roles. So there's a lot of new roles being created in this IT environment. So how do we find out who the best people are for these roles? Certifications can help you stand out. In fact, certification can help you stand out in ways where your current role doesn't. If you have a particular role with very limited view, having a certification in something completely different can say, you know, I'm more than just the backup operator on the evening shift. I actually, I've got other skills. I've learned more, I've done training, I've invested in who I am, and I would like you to invest in me as well. Especially as we start to move outside of the IT department. As we start to move into different roles in different parts of the business, being able to prove who we are and what we can do will become a big part of being an IT professional. So let's have a look at some of these certifications. We're going to look at both soft certifications and technical certifications. And that's why I've got my panel with me today. So the first one I want to look at is probably one of the biggest. It is the PMP, which is Project Management Professional. You can see the average salary there is 108000 And this is from a uh, monitored by something called PMI. And actually going to pass it over to Thomas for a moment. Could you tell us a little bit? And keep in mind, we're looking for, is this, a, is this the right role for a technician? I would say it's the number one role that uh, technical people should be looking at because they don't realize that almost everything they touch in IT actually has a project framework around it and they're involved in projects and they're executing at some level on a project team and there are deliverables. Most people don't realize that if you're embarking on a project even though the business is heading it up, IT is right behind the business needs and they should be leveraged at all times. Okay. So, as an IT professional, if I want to become, I know I've got a slide here, and I'm going to test in five different roles, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing. Um, but I think this is the part that people are interested in. Uh, it says 35 hours of training, which I assume I can do that through a class. Absolutely. Um, and then I get hit with 7,500 hours of project manager experience if I don't have a bachelor's degree, or 45, I mean 7,500 or 40. How do I get this project experience if I'm an IT guy? Well, I call it the secret of, of detailing your little black book. And the little black book is all about gathering all that information that you've dedicated time on a project, been involved with, with deliverables, engaged with other stakeholders. Do yourself a favor. Invest in that little black book, and that's all about recording your project time and your deliverables. Because to be honest with you, when the time comes where you're actually filling out the application for that, you will be actually triggered to ask yourself, hey, what did I do on that project, and what was my role, and what was my team, and what were my deliverables? And if you've detailed it out, it's all there for you. So as you're saying, I mean, IT is really living and breathing projects all the time. Daily. So, and you're engaging with stakeholders all the time. And if you're just a project player, there are many different levels about being involved in a project. Okay, excellent. Thank you, thank you. So, absolutely, we can, we can log up those hours fairly quickly. And, um, and then we, we write an exam. Um, what exam do I, do I look at? Is there, there's the PMI, oh, the PMP. Is there, there's another one, I believe, as well. That you... I call it the two levels of certification. And I'm going to be a little bit biased here, Andrew, okay. only because I love working with the individuals that are new to project management, that share enthusiasm, just who've been bitten by the bug of just joining a project and having deliverables and being accounted for. They jump into the entry level of certification, which is the Certified Associate in Project Management. It's entry level, but it shows commitment to project management. It shows commitment to being involved in projects and project teams. And it actually shows your team that you have a desire to be a functional part of that project and wanting more. Fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. So one of the other ones that's fairly big and, and uh, critical is the IT uh, infrastructure library, ITIL, as well as you know about it, right? So uh, ITIL um, was developed uh, many years ago to give sort of standardized IT management, and it's become a big part of IT today. Many companies are using an IT modality, or an ITIL modality, um, to really control what they're doing with their environment. So again, I'm going to pack that up to Thomas, because I think that's your 
Can you tell us a bit more about ITIL? I've got a, um, I can tell you a little bit more about the audience and how they have desire in ITIL, which is very important. Most people that we're currently working with have a, have, an, have a passion for processes and improving processes internally to satisfy customers. We use the word help desk as an old-fashioned word and service desk is involved, yep. but the majority of clients that we work with are heavily involved in service desk and want to improve best practices and services aligned to ITIL. And they have a desire to come and get certification and gain certification to further prove their standing in capabilities and understanding all the best practices aligned to ITIL. There is a certification plan that sort of gets you from zero to hero, yep. is what I call you. Um, if you're looking for entry level foundation or even if you're not looking for uh, certification, we've got awareness sessions built into surrounding team members who just want to get their feet wet people who want to go for ITEL Foundation certified and write their exam. Choose the right path and move forward. If you'd like to become an ITEL expert, gather 22 credits to completion. So it's all available to you depending on how much of a, of a passion and commitment that you'd like to, to move up and forward in ITEL. So if, if you're an ITEL shop, just having ITEL Foundations allows you to be the same language as everybody else and understand their expectations. Absolutely, Absolutely. And, and not only that, but it shows commitment about improving services. Excellent. Okay. So one of the next ones we have here is the VMware, and uh, VMware Certified Professional. We're looking at a lot of virtualization going on, especially in hosted virtualization. You see the annual salary there of uh, 94000 um, It was originally just VCP, uh, but the VCP, or the uh, Data Center of virtualiz uh, Virtualization, Validates the ability to install, configure, manage, and scale out VMware vSphere environments. So just another example of where you can sort of, look, I have this experience in virtualization. Brad, well, I'm going to talk to you now. I just want to talk about Cisco for a minute. I see the average salary is 81000 and And we know, I mean, everybody heard of the CCNA, but the CCNA is not what it used to be. That, that's correct. What Cisco has done is they're continually updating their program and course outline syllabus to go from a focus to hardware based into a job role environment. Uh, so they're usually continue to do a, ref a refresh of that every two to three years. Uh, for the CCNA, for those that don't know, uh, CCNA is a Cisco Certified Network Associate. It is a, an entry level uh, knowledge base and, and it gives people the foundational networking uh, knowledge that shows that they have the ability to install, configure, operate, troubleshoot, medium size, routed and switch, it, switch networks. Usually they have one to three years of, of hands-on experience for that. The key thing here is the route switch is, is the most popular, but we've now within the Cisco portfolio, they've broken that out into a number of different uh, portfolios like you know data center security, uh, voice and collaboration, and, and wireless. And one of the things we want to highlight is um, we, we do have what we call the bubble chart. Uh, it actually shows uh, the certification, how it has like a, a bottom-up rule, and you can either move up in that particular area of certification, or you can go across, uh, depending on what your job role or your personal interest is. The higher up you go, the deeper dive it gets from a technology point of view. And the, one, the one reason that uh, you may want to go through a particular stream or spread out is for the IT advisors. Uh, they would be more interested in certification across different platforms. That's because their their job roles require them to have a, a knowledge base in like voice or broader. Yeah. broader. Yeah. On the specialists, they would be the ones that would try to go through the achievement of the CCIE level within that product portfolio. How, how hard is it to get a CCIE? It's, it's extremely difficult. I, I can say from just the associate level, uh, there is quite a bit of, of investment from a personal point of view to do the studying, the, the knowledge base, uh, the hands-on, getting to understand and be familiar with the, the lab environments and writing the Cisco exam. It is a proctored exam. Yep. Um, as you get deeper into the, uh, the professional and expert level, uh, they get much more difficult. For example, the, the CCIE route switch, it has two components with it. It has a written exam and then it also has a hands-on lab exam this entire day for that. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I was sort of getting at, because as a, as a specialist, um, you, you sort of got to be committed to a specialist. A, a generalist wouldn't be looking, or an advisor wouldn't be looking at going to the CCIE, because that's not their role. But a specialist would probably be 
asked to maintain, depending on what their role is, what they do, a CCIE uh, certification, and maybe more than just one, uh, maybe in the wireless and the voice and security. Yeah, um, so you can see there's a great time commitment there to become a specialist, but you get the higher compensation to do so. So that's where it came the different roles we're looking at. So Microsoft, I'll uh, have a quick chat about this one, but Microsoft, the flagship one is the MCSE, or the Microsoft Certified System. Uh, it used to be called System Engineer. They've actually, Microsoft's changed the name uh, a couple of years ago, and it's now called the Solutions Expert. And uh, average salary, 95000 And it is the top end of a multiple um, line of certifications for Microsoft. Uh, MTA is the bottom end, and MTA is actually for people who uh, probably are non-IT or looking at sort of changing within IT. Um, and it is a, is an onboarding one, and you really don't need a lot of requirements to go back. But it does have a certification. Even project managers and, and, and business analysts could take an MTA in, in Network Fundamentals so they could better understand some of the projects they're working on. The MCSE is probably the heart um, of load certifications around uh, Microsoft, and that gives you um, sort of the, uh, the, the, the associate level of certification, um, and it is the prerequisite for a lot of different MCSE certifications. So uh, uh, the path to go. Back to certification again, we've got the uh, Citrix Certified Administrator for uh, Citrix Zen app. I'm looking at A9K here. And validates the ability to install, support, administer, and troubleshoot a Citrix uh, Zen app environment. And again, a lot of different virtualization options out there right now, and just a way to uh, uh, make you stand out there when people are looking. When we're talking about all these different certifications, the one thing to, uh, to keep in mind and keep this important is that it's a layer cake. You have different skills that get added on to make you who you are, to, to, to expand your role. And I said earlier that we may not need system administrators anymore, but we still need their skills. So in this particular case, you know, I can't just become a security person overnight. I need to understand what the network is before I understand security on that network. Um, and as we move into cloud-based operations, I need to understand basic networking before I understand how it's hosted from a cloud situation. So those things you have to keep in mind. This is why a lot of your skills you have today aren't going away. We still need your skills, but we need to layer those skills with new skills. We need to layer them with business process skills so you can better operate within the business. We need to layer them with new IT skills if you're going the specialist route. There are a number of cloud certifications that have come available in the last little while. A lay of knowledge placed on top of previous knowledge that I just mentioned. And they normally cover cloud-specific topics around design and benefits and transformation plans. One of the main ones here we're looking at is cloud credential um, certificate council certifications. And they've got a whole sort of range, whether you are into the architect side of thing, you're a developer, you're a service manager, you're an administrator. Um, or security manager, and they start off with just the essentials at the bottom, so the cloud technology associate level. And I won't go through each of these areas of study, but there are quite a few, and these can be laid on top of what you already know. And again, it lets you stand out within the organization. The cloud associate, for instance, and virtualization associate, uh, would be still good for non-IT people to understand what's going on in cloud projects. So the question here is, what should you do? What is your end goal? As an IT professional, what do you want to, uh, to accomplish by this? I want to find out, just before we go too much further, who actually holds a certification in our audience. Do you have a question we can put up there? All right, everyone in your GoToWebinar viewer, you should have your next quick poll. Do you currently hold a certification? So please select one, technical. Uh, business process, IABA, PMI, etc. You hold both the technical and non-technical certifications, or you don't hold any certifications. So we'll just give everyone a moment to make their selection. And I will remind everyone that we are recording a session, and we will send a copy of the recording to everyone that has registered, uh, so you can pass that along uh, if you have a, a colleague or a uh, perhaps a director <laughs> that uh, you want to share this with. All right, I'm giving everyone a second, so let me go ahead and share that results. So technical, uh, no business process. Um, 
hold both technical and non-technical 22% or don't hold any 22%. 22%. So that is interesting. And, I, and I'm actually interested that we don't have any business process. Um, I'm surprised. Yeah. That is something that, um, you know, a lot of the audience, those especially with technical, should be looking at and, um, and investigating because this is where some of the biggest changes are going to come in the next little while is to have the business side to be able to communicate with the business about some of the technical projects and provide the business with some technical information. So, and 22% uh, don't hold any, interesting. And some of you hold both technical and non-technical certifications. And we could be all day trying to figure out what those non-technical ones are, but there's lots of them. And that's probably a good combination. Those 22% probably have a good combination for going forward if they're going to be in the IT advisor role. Um, because it shows that they have both the technical side and the non-technical side. So here's another one. Actually, we'll go back, come back to that in a second. So just keep in mind, when we talk about certification choices, an IT specialist would need to be recognized as an expert in their field. This is what they're being paid for. So as an IT specialist, having a high level MCSE, CCIE certification is what they're being paid for, and this is what they have to maintain, and they're required to build confidence in the clients. Top-level certifications may be required by, for partner recognition as well. If you're a Cisco partner or a Microsoft partner or a VMware partner, you're required to be certified as well, or hold many people certified. As an IT advisor, though, your choice is a little bit different. There'll be an internal resource to business clients. Certifications prove that you have an understanding of the technology, but also that you have an understanding of business requirements. If you're going to be working with a lot of project managers, understanding what they're looking for and the methodology they're going to use is going to make you a lot easier to work with and a lot more effective. So as an IT advisor, you're going to be looking at multiple certifications and different certifications. Just uh, for interest, let's do a question of, uh, you know, my fourth question here. I want to know what sort of... Uh, culture you have within your company around certification? So my company supports certification, i.e. pays for my training and certification, reimburses me for my certification costs, contributes to my certification costs, or doesn't support certification at all. Give everyone a moment to make their selection. Any predictions? I think we should make see a range. Right. I think we might see a range. Might be a lower the place. Yeah. But well, we do have 22% say they don't hold a cert currently. Yeah, and that may, they may end up with a uh, that doesn't support certification uh, as well. Hmm. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the results with everyone now. And 33%, so that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So really, you know, quite, quite even reimburses me for my certification cost at 15%. You know, pays for my, my training and certification and doesn't support certification at all. The two extremes, 33%, both of them. Yeah. So, Kind of the full gamut there. So it's probably, um, you know, it changes your view of, 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 of what you do and how you do it. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of difference between the first and second answer, which was, you know, my company pays for everything or my company reimburses me when I go to write an exam. Um, but it can change how you think about it because the risk is yours. So that was interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm hoping some of these answers are also interesting to other people, just to see how people around you are treated and where you are and where they are. Some of you may be thinking, wow, I'm in a great company because I'm got paid, paid for it. And some of you in the uh, bottom 33% may go, hey, it's other companies. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's switch slides here very quickly. One of the things you can do is take inventory in those top rated soft skills. And what we looked at with top rated soft skills is things like teamwork. Um, customer service, strong ethic. This is what people are looking for. Motivation, uh, flexibility and adaptability, project management skills. Um, big one we hear for IT people, uh, verbal and written communication skills. And this doesn't mean that you can't, I mean, you know, we're not talking that people can't write an email. The problem is they find IT people focus too much on the IT part of the solution. And they want to be able to have communication that makes sense at their level. So making sure they can communicate an idea properly at the level of everybody in the room. Analytical skills, problem solving, okay, and innovation and creative problem solving skills. 
one of the things that we're going to see of the next of us, again, this is from the um, IT Skills and Salary Report from Global Knowledge and Windows IT Pro, technical professionals can add to their earning potential by branching into areas of business process improvement, including ITIL. And you notice from our last survey there, we had nobody who was certified in business process improvement. Uh, we didn't actually ask about ITIL. Maybe that was in there. Um, but that includes ITIL, business intelligence, Sigma. Um, these are really sort of skills that can be looked for along with technical skills. So we have people out there who have the business process skills who are looking to, to get some technical skills, but we also have a lot of people with technical skills who need to compete and get some of the uh, business process skills. So one of the things you should be looking at here is keeping yourself relevant. Be aware of how the market is changing, how quickly it's changing. Okay? Sometimes within a company, we don't know what's going on around in different areas. Be aware of the direction your company is taking and understand the role that you want to play. So is anything changing within your company? Is your role likely to change? And what role, future role, would you like to take on? Okay? And we talked about this in our earlier podcast, which is you know, take control of your career growth, take control of your career direction, okay? and make sure that um, you are getting what you require to go the direction that you want to go. Okay? It's a benefit to your company because you now have the drive and you'll be, you'll be getting better skills, and they can put to those to better use. We've actually looked at, today, a number of different pathfinders. And um, those pathfinders, I think, will be made available. Sarah, can we make those available somewhere? Yeah, actually, if you visit globalknowledge.ca, choose your path. All of our pathfinders for certifications and even some um, pathways for uh, different skill sets um, that are, might not necessarily lead to a certification, yep. but will equip you with all of those different uh, types of skills that you need are on uh, globalknowledge.ca, choose your path. It's a fantastic resource. Fantastic, fantastic. There's also a Global Knowledge certification website, mm -hmm. and that's got information about Tons of information, tons of certification on, you know, we cover just a high level of all of the different types of certifications there are, but there are uh, recognized certifications from uh, many different industries, uh, professional organizations um, that Global Knowledge can help you uh, get on your, your path for those. So visit globalknowledge.ca certification. That lists out everything, and I think everyone will, you know, that graphic kind of shows that we have a ton of, of different areas for people to enhance their skills. Absolutely. And there's a benefit to doing this, isn't there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, I do want to let everyone know that we have a great promotion on right now. Um, so some of our eligible courses, um, some of our courses are eligible for you to get um, some great gear like a GoPro camera, an iPad. Check out globalknowledge.ca uh, uh, and perhaps maybe along your pathway there's a course you want to take and you can get some great gear. We're going to answer some questions in a few minutes, but don't forget you can always engage with us on Twitter. We're always listening. Um, so. Talk to us. Tell us what, what you like, what you don't like, what certifications you're, you're interested in, what you think about some of the certifications. We'd love to hear some of the feedback. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. We're going to take some time here to sort of answer some questions. Um, I've got Brad with me. I've got Thomas with me. So if it's a both business process question um, or a Cisco or, or a Veo or Microsoft, throw some questions out. We'll see what we can do to answer some of them here. Um, you can reach me. There's my email. You can also reach me on Twitter. And uh, I'd love to hear from you there as well. So thank you for that. Sarah, I'll leave it over to you to sort of let some of the questions again. Great. So um, there's tons of questions coming in. So um, let me just uh, take care of a couple right off the bat. Uh, so uh, a couple of people are asking about uh, the reporting. So we will send you a reporting. Um, it'll be an email uh, as soon as it is available to a link to the reporting so you can review all of this. I know we went very, very quickly, um, and people are really, really interested. Um, so, uh, not surprisingly, most of the questions are for, for business training um, because not <laughs> ever, uh, nobody is, is, has those certifications on here. So, um, we've, we've had a couple questions about you know, more experienced IT professionals um, who have experience, perhaps they've taken courses. What is that certification or, or you know, taking the exam for project management? What is that really going to do for them when they, you know, are experienced in their field? I say it elevates their profile within their, their environment to a 
capable project player because the business is now looking at you as a valuable player for the business and executing on their projects. And not only that, but creating business value as well. And when you're actually a PMP certified person, you're actually telling the world that you've got skills behind you and you've got a certification behind you and it makes you very valuable that you can um, complete a project from start to finish and, and create business value. And that's, a, that's the word, the buzzword for the business. They want to know that we can create projects and that we can complete them on time and on budget. So Thomas, though, I'm going to ask you a question here. As an IT professional, I've been doing IT my entire career, am I going to be the odd one out if I show up to the first business analyst class? I mean, is everybody else there being doing business analyst stuff? I mean, who? Him, uh, yeah. You'll be pleasantly surprised that I'd say half of the audience inside that business analysis classroom comes from IT. And some of the best business analysts that I've ever worked with came out of IT because they're exceptional at uh, requirements gathering, they ask fantastic questions, they're enthusiastic, they, they want to gather the right type of requirements for those, for those business projects. And they're highly engaging and you wouldn't be alone. Excellent. Thanks. Sir? Uh, so, uh, there's a couple of questions here. Um, I'm just going to lump them in together because it's about the hours involved to get your PMP uh, certification. So, Thomas, you give a really great tip, you know, keep your black book out. But what if, you know, someone didn't really realize that they, that was the track that they wanted to go on? You know, what can they do to kind of look back on their career to try and start scoping out those hours? So it's funny that you should mention that because somebody did ask me that a while ago. When I actually just sat down with them and said, Let's talk about some of the projects that you worked on about four years ago. And when they had that moment of reflection, believe it or not, they documented that project down. And that's what we need you to do. Start documenting the project down, the players that were involved, what your role was, what was your responsibility. Reach out to a few of those old contacts that you had and ask them if they'd be references for you because I have news for everybody. They probably will call and ask for your deliverables on the project, your responsibilities, and they want to validate your references. And there's nothing wrong with good networking. And I think that everybody involved should, should realize that, that it's just part of the certification. And there's nothing wrong with having um, references that were part of past projects, especially if, you, if they were very successful. So please do yourself a favor to sit down and just start writing things down. You'd be pleasantly surprised as to what you'd be able to uncover. Uh, so the balance. So PMP so people who have strong IT tech skills, uh, they want to start improving their business acumen. Um, where, where do they start? What, is it a course? Is it a conversation with their leader? Where do they, where do they start? Well, speaking from the IT side of things, people that are certified in, in Cisco, it's, it's kind of, we, we don't know what we don't know. And this is what we're looking for, is if we're really good on the, the technical skills. And what we're saying here is, is don't lose those technical skills. Make sure that you're, you keep your certs up to date. But it's the step of what should we be looking at? Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll pose it to, to Thomas. Um, should the IT folks look at, at an ITIL? Should they jump into PMP? Um, maybe take a cloud course? or some kind of just communications. I, I do know that from the technical point of view, uh, there is a, a bit of a shift with, uh, within organizations where they want the, the IT folks in the boardroom explaining the value, the business value of what they're doing in a project. And they have to be, have good, strong communication skills. So maybe, Thomas, you can get some recommendations. We're looking at ITIL, we're looking at business skills. Okay, well let's take a look, for, step back for just a quick second. I don't think that communication skills or improving anyone's communication skills will hurt anybody. In the long run, it'll improve your position, it'll improve stakeholder engagement, it'll bring value that way. So either way, even if you are an IT guy or IT fellow struggling with IT communication, so is everybody else. And that's okay. So I think that that'll improve along the way. I think that if you're constantly engaged in projects or within stakeholder engagements or stakeholder engagement moments, well, either you're leaning towards being a great business analyst, which is fantastic, or a project contributor that will lead to PMP certification. And I think the road is very clear that way. And if you're engaged in projects, well, congratulations. People are leaning towards you because they see value in what you're bringing to the table, that you're organized, that you're able to lead, that you're able to complete a task. 
That is most important. And I think that answers the question, whether or not you'd like to be engaged on a project level at some point. In great projects, I always say, well, if the project ended on time and ended on budget and the stakeholders were pleased, I always say, let's look at your team. You will find a great business analyst who helped gather all the requirements that helped keep everybody on target. And if they were moving, they managed the risks all along the way. So I always say to them, business analysts are very valuable to the project environment. Thanks, Thomas, and, uh, and uh, thanks, Brad. Um, one of the things I'd probably add to both what you're saying, and maybe it's a simple really step that people start with, is, is maybe presentation skills. Because a lot of these IT people have never had the chance to sort of present an idea to a group of people. And that may be not part of, the, part of their skill set. So just be able to break down an idea and make it available for people who are non-technical and present it in such a way that makes sense. So that's another quick start as well. So there's, there's many ways to sort of get started. Um, so I've had a couple of questions about uh, the changing IT field. Yes. So um, this is actually a, a topic uh, that Andrew presented on a, a few days ago. You can hit the recording at um, our Knowledge Center, globalknowledge.ca. It was called uh, Career Management in the Digital right. Age. Um, so we've had one of our questions is about uh, the take on the, the two pyramids. I don't know. Could you put that back up? Yep. Um, just to, to show everyone. Um, because really that webinar was talking a lot about how um, the IT pro uh, really can navigate their career through this, this change. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys maybe would just take out a few seconds just to talk about this a little bit. With in mind, you know, what are, um, as we change into the new model, what can new people into the new IT work on, and then what is a pathway for someone that's more experienced? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, let me just go back to this, this model again for a moment to understand why. In the old model, help desk was sort of the largest group because they are the best side support. That is going away because we're no longer having to install a lot of applications locally. These are web-based services. So if I don't have to install an application locally on your machine, you're bringing your own machine, whether it be a tablet or whatever, then from a support point of view, all I have to do is make sure that you can reach the landing page for whatever service we're offering. So from a support point of view, I need very little in the way of help desk. Well, that's the largest part of IT today, and that's changing. There's a lot of people who need to find new roles. So that's what I meant by that pyramid, why we're turning, turning it over. So with that in mind, we need to take a look at what other groups are there. And I said the technology services are going to be the largest group, and they are because they're going to be the ones who are working on new projects, on new services being offered. What services will help the company go? Now, Brad, I think you had a, uh, I'm just looking for the slide you were talking about here. And, uh, and, and from the Cisco point of view, I can see that Cisco has actually adopted this, this changing role of uh, the IT, the IT role and how it's changing, where they've actually gone through a refresh of some of their, their course portfolios, like security, for example, uh, the route switch, where they've gone away from getting knowledge and training on the individual hardware, and it's more on the job role and having to focus on that. Yep, no, absolutely. And this is, this is the one thing we need to take a look at, is that, you know, IT is going to be in every part of the business. So, um, you know, that's how things have changed. We need to take a look and see how IT will influence those different parts of the business. And maybe skills you had before you got into IT would also be part of this. So for new IT people coming into the role, Probably help desk is, you know, used to be the onboarding area. They may need to find another board. They may need to find other skills to get involved. But having those IT skills along with accounting skills or HR skills may be helpful. Having project skills to go along with those skills may be helpful. And you'll find a lot of different um, um, secondary school education when it comes to this includes some of these skills right now when they talk about IT project, project management. Those who have been around for a while, they've, you know, they've got the skills. Uh, and they may be more involved in, uh, in the business side of things than they were, you know, years ago. Uh, they just need to sort of stretch those skills and adapt a bit more. So what do you think the balance is? Do you think, you know, it's IT people have the technical skills, so now that they should move to soft skills, is it 50-50? You know, it, it depends on what they want to do, right? I think the first step is deciding whether or not well, they want to be an advisor or a specialist. And that's going to really set them in two different directions. If you're a specialist, you've got to be a specialist. There's no half measure there. You've got to be at the top of your game because that's what you're being paid for. If you are an advisor, then you need to spread out your skills as much as possible and be ready. 
consider this, if you're working for a very large company and a project comes available, you would send out your CV as a, you know, who you are. So how do you sort of stretch that out? If a lot of IT type projects come up, which they will come up, do you have any sort of IT background that you can share if you're coming from the non-IT side of the house? So we're going to have people out there, VAs and PMs and that sort of thing, who will be getting IT skills to flush out their uh, role. So it seems to make sense for the IT people to get more business skills to flush out their role. There's going to be a little bit of a competition going on, I think, in some areas um, for different groups. Uh, and and so, do you think that some of the the people that are project managers, that are certified project managers and the BAs, are going to be looking more for IT technical training as well and certification? Well, the old model used to be that the the BA talked to the system analyst, and they work things out. A lot of companies right now are using the role business system analyst, which just means somebody who is both a business analyst and a system analyst who could be one person, and that means less broken telephone conversations. That means that one person provides the answer and can think in both sides at the same time. So yeah, I think we're going to find uh, non-IT people looking for IT skills, and we're going to find IT people looking for those business skills. And there will be a little bit of competition. Just a quick comment on that. You find a lot of them are engaged with stakeholders with business needs. And all of a sudden, they're being asked to elevate their skills. And that's when they lean over to organizations like Global Knowledge and said, I need some support, I need some help. And that sometimes takes off after that. So what is the next step? You know, for people that are, are wondering what to do next, they're kind of thinking about certification, um, what, is, what is their best course of action right now? Um, inventory of their own skills, I think is the first step, is to, is to really to, to write down what, what do I know, what can I, and that doesn't mean the current job role, it means that they're in all their job roles. What do they learn? What, do they, what can they do? And figure out, the next step after that is what route they want to take. All set, Andrew. Terrific. We are almost out of time. Gentlemen, thank you. Are there any final thoughts? You know, Thomas, why don't we, we start with you? Any final thoughts for our audience today? I'm taking off where Andrew left off. Take an inventory of your skills. And where do you need to go next? Ask yourself the question. Fred? As far as certification, um, make it a part of your personal decision. Um, include your family, your friends, uh, tweet about it, uh, say that I want to do this, whether it's technical or non-technical, uh, make it a whole part of moving forward. And I'll actually extend that idea because certification is a commitment. It, um, you know, you, we, it's like doing anything else. Oh, we'll get around to that. You really sort of have to set a date and say, you know what, I'm going to certify. Um, actually, can we do one more question just before we, uh, we finish off? So just before we finish off here, I'm going to throw out one more question and just find out what the audience feels about certification. What are your plans for certification? I'm currently prepping within the next six months, six to 12 months. I'm thinking about it, and I have no plans. You know what? I bet this answer would have changed if we had, we had put it at the top of the call. And then that, that's what's really interesting. Maybe we should have yeah, asked this twice. Maybe, maybe done that. All right. Um, Right. You know what? There's lots of activity, so I just want to give it a few more seconds. All right. Share. Currently so, prepping. Yeah. Look at that. 28% are currently prepping for um, and another 24. So, I mean, that's half the people who are going to be currently prepping for exam or going to be taking an exam in the next um, six months. And then we have another two, seven, and then we have people thinking about it. only 3% actually have no plans around certification. So, obviously, there's importance for certification out there. It's just picking the right paths and the right certifications to build out what you want. Call us. We want to talk to you. <laughs> I was just going to give a little plug. We have amazing training advisors that can help you, you know, do your own path and take a look at, you know, after you've done your inventory of skills on um, some great advice on where to go next. So I do want to encourage people to reach out. We will be sending an email with all of our contact information as well. Gentlemen, thank you. This has been great um, and hugely valuable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep, thank thank you, you, everyone. All right, everyone, you can now disconnect.